Good evening. Once again, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study at Good News Church. Uh, uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We all will rejoice and be glad in it. We pray that you've had a blessed week this far, that you had a wonderful Lord's Day this past Sunday of uh, worshiping our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I know I did. I took cut a couple of things I want to say once again is thank you to Good News Church once again for helping me celebrate not only uh, Pastor's Appreciation Month, but also my 63rd birthday. That was a blessing. I praise God for that and uh, all that was done, all the gifts, all the words that was said. And then we topped it off on this uh, Sunday after I came home, got a chance to watch the football game, even though uh, my Rams did not uh, bring it out, but it was a joy just to watch it with family and celebrate that time. So it was a good Sunday. Amen. So we praise God for it. And then we want to uh, also remind those who were into this time, and it was only a few weeks we got away, gotten away from, the time that we'll be uh, voting. So if you have not registered or if you have not uh, made your mind up on these propositions that's coming up and then on for the mayors and the things that are up, we're going to ask that you would spend some time because one of the things I want to say about this is because the Bible tells us uh, over in the book of, I think it's in First Timothy, is that, that we ought to pray for those who have authority over us, that we would live in peace. And the only way we're going to live at peace is so we're going to have to pray for those, whether uh, you're a Republican, whether you're a Democrat or independent, uh, we need to pray for those leaders that uh, are ending up in uh, leadership over us. Because one thing I want to say, because all, uh, all authority is given by God. I know and sometimes it's hard for us to understand that why God will put someone in charge that is uh, maybe immoral or not uh, truthful. But if you go back and you look out through the Old Testament, when you look at the Old Testament, he used a person like Nebuchadnezzar. He used uh, wicked kings. There were only a few great kings that you even had in the Old Testament. And God used them mostly to bring his people back to himself. So what I'm trying to say is that let's be prayerful during this season here. Ask God to lead us and to guide us that we will be, as kingdom people, that we pray as we pray in our the Lord's uh, model prayer, which says, Thy will be done on earth as it will be in heaven. So I just wanted to say that because so often uh, we take it for granted of voting and uh, making our voice heard. Sometimes things go and we say, I burden for this. It doesn't make any sense. No, it always makes sense when you go with something in your heart. So do uh, you have a freedom, especially as an Afro-American people that we didn't always have. So while we still have that freedom, let's use our voice and let God be here. He will be the one that will uh, put who we have in there, but he still wants his people. That's why he tells us over in Chronicles, if my people, which are called by my name, which just means that we acknowledge him, that we are humble in ourselves and pray, which would mean that we humble ourselves, realizing and saying that we can't make it in life without God, even though we take it for granted. He said, humble yourself and see you in dependence on him. Humble yourself and what? Pray, meaning that you're seeking him. Turn from your wicked ways. Have a repentant heart. When God shows you that you are out of the will of God or something is your life, that you repent of it. Confess it and repent of it. Then he says, then we will hear from heaven and he will heal our land. So in other words, I take that passage of scripture and say that we need to do our part. God's going to do his part, but you and I as a people of God need to do our part as being a time of voting. Amen. So without further ado, we're going to get right into a time of prayer, and then we'll get into our scripture tonight. So let's look to the scripture. And one of the things that we always want to remind you, here are the things on the screens that we need to be praying for. Praying for families. Praying for those who have been in bereavement. Pray for those who have contacted this virus. Pray for our churches. Pray for unity in the government, our unsaved loved ones. Pray for healing for those who are sick or maybe have psychological problems. And you know, one of the things that I keep hearing more and more that uh, there has been more people struggling psychologically 
than we are and mentally in uh, a time since the pandemic. Uh, divorce rate was up because families had to stay together uh, in the house together. They couldn't deal with each other. And we need to pray for our president, President Biden, and the decisions that he's making. Whether you or even agree with him or not, pray for him because he needs it. Pray for our pastors who are preaching the gospel and for those who are getting caught up in it. Sometimes that we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing uh, when God is calling us to be faithful to his word. Pray for the finances, your personal church finances, and for our country. So with all that's been said done, let us look to the Lord. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we come tonight, Father, as we always do, Father, looking unto you because you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. Oh God, and we ask you right now, oh God, that you would first search our hearts and search our minds, oh God, as we prepare our hearts now to even go into your word, to preach it and to teach it, and to even in prayer, Father. Forgive us, Father, for the sins that we have done knowingly, Father. And oh God, the sins that we have done unknowingly, Father, that we have done something that's not pleasing in your sight, are we have not been faithful. Forgive us in the name of Jesus. And we want to say thank you, Father, because we know, Father, the blood of your Son continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know without you we can do nothing, Father, but with you all things are possible. For, Father, the things that we have called out for the bereavement in our churches, our government, for our unsaved loved ones, for the president, for healing, for finances, and all of those, Father, we pray that thy will be done tonight. Glorify yourself, Father, in each of these situations. And those, Father, who need that healing, Father, spiritually and physically, we pray, O oh God, we come to you because you are Jehovah Jireh, a God that heals physically. And Father, you said by your stripes we are healed. You will heal us spiritually, Father, if we only ask. So have your way tonight, Father, and we be careful to give your name the praise and glory as we go through these scriptures tonight. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. All right, for our scripture reading tonight, as we know, we've been talking about it, we are in the book of Romans. And we're talking about, we're in this first chapter, and in this first chapter so far, we had our introduction of what the book is all about. And we said the central theme of that is faith righteousness. Faith righteousness. Then secondly, we had Paul give us an introduction, introducing, uh, introducing us to himself. And then after that, he gives us uh, his breakdown of, about the gospel. We had the provisions of the gospel, the purpose of the gospel, the power of the gospel, all those he gave us in those first eight verses. Then from uh, the verses that we have now talking about uh, true sp and spiritual leadership, Paul gives us a heart of what he was all about. And then one of the things I said that in these verses that we're talking about, this is the type of spirit of faithful service should be in those who have accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we're going to go over those once again so you can hear, and I'll kind of mention those before we get where we are tonight. So we're asking you now that you will uh, look at these passages here. We go to the next one and find out the spirits that we have. Because we're saved, we're going to read these scriptures here from verses 8 through 15 and talk about what Paul is giving us. And it reads, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer, asking that somehow by God's will I will I make now at least succeed, may make last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far has been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearing and reading of his holy word. In those verses there that we just read to you and we kind of talk about it, kind of went over just a little hit on the subject that we said. In those, what we see is Paul revealing his heart of not only that he wanted to go to 
to Rome to give them to gospel and to help them grow. But Paul, we see the heart of Paul and what the heart of Paul is in a spiritual leadership, but also should be in the servant's heart of you and I as a believer. Very first thing we talked about, Paul was thankful. And we said for everyone that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we should have a thankful spirit. Why? Because from the verse, first of all, God saved us out of, brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Not because of what we have done, but because we have accepted Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, and then on the third day he rose from the grave according to the scripture. That we're thankful for the gospel that we didn't have to die to be saved. Christ died for us. It gives us a thankful spirit because the Bible says, for all have sinned and did what? Come short of the glory of God. So we ought to check ourselves and make sure we're thankful for just being saved. Amen. Secondly, Paul had what you call a concerned spirit. Paul was not just wanting to go to Rome just because he wanted to be seen. or that He was concerned for those saints. The majority of the saints that were in the church of Rome have accepted the Lord on the day of Pentecost. A lot of them have gotten saved. And they have, uh, some of them was in Jerusalem and some of them passed off and their people had gotten saved and they have not really grown. In other words, they believe what Jesus Christ done. They accepted that. But they had no one that really come in to teach them to grow in their faith. So that's the reason why we say the book of Romans is one of the most theological books that we have out of the letter to writings of Paul. First of all, because he was giving those who were saved, but they were immature in their faith, some doctrinal truth that they are to build their lives on. Then what comes about, he had a concerned spirit for their spiritual growth. Third thing that he says that they ought to have. Once you're taught that and you have, you ought to have a willing and submissive spirit. In other words, willing to, when you're taught the truth, a willing to give your will over to him and surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Paul says in here, he said, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Let me help you out with that. What he's meaning that Paul said, yes, I'm alive, but he died when Christ died. He died. His will to do what he wants to do died. And what he did, he gave that over and he submitted to the will of the Holy Spirit. So the life that he is living, he's living through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, what comes about that is the two next spirit that we talk about that should be in us. It's very first thing is what? A loving spirit. And one of the things he said, a person that have submitted their will over to the Lord, now they are what? A more of a loving person. Now, let me say this here, because one of the fruits of the Spirit, and I'm going to talk about it for a moment, the very fruit, I say, is what? Love. One of the things when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it says the Holy Spirit has poured out, poured into us His Spirit. In other words, we didn't get just a spirit of forgiveness, but He has given us a loving spirit. Because when you got Christ, you got God, and God is what? God is love, right? Amen. Then he says also what comes with that is a humble spirit. Something that we all need, Paul said, and he, he had a humble spirit. He was not concerned. He all depended on Christ. And then we had the next one, the next spirit that he has that he was talking to us about where we're going to pick up tonight and we're going to talk about these last and hopefully we'll get a chance to finish these four tonight and next week we'll get into talking about the wrath of God. The very first one is a fruitful spirit a fruitful spirit. And this is right here I need to define. Then we can talk about an obedient spirit, an eager spirit, and a, a bold spirit. And the, the time that we have in the next 30 minutes, I hope to get through those. So as we see, we go to the next one. The very first one here, as he says here, is a what? A fruitful spirit. Let me define that first. A fruitful spirit now is not just talking about, uh, we're going to find that a fruitful spirit works in two ways. It means something is fruitful, meaning it grows. It means it has something that's healthy for you. Amen. It's fruitful. Unfruitful means it's unhealthy and it's not active. But this is what we're going to talk about. So, and where did it come from? Paul takes us and we're just walking through these verses. So, if you take your Bibles and follow, follow with us as we go to Romans now, 1 verse 13. And here's what Paul says. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brother, or uninformed, or not knowingly, brethren. He's not talking to the unsaved here. He's talking to the saved. That's why he identifies them as brethren. 
that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. In other words, Paul said his desire was when he heard about the church of Rome and what was going on there, that their faith was spoken of by there. He wanted to come to them because he realized that they're part, they're saved. They're, these are saved folks. And he said, but was let hitherto. That I, then he said here, but I was let hitherto. In other words, he was hindered that I may have some what? Fruit among you also, even as among the Gentiles. Now, why, why this is important? Because he's talking to, there are some Jewish people that were in the church of Rome and also Gentile. But what he says here, fruit among you, which means those are saved. And when he says among other Gentiles, which means they're un-Gentiles when it's used here in the book of Romans like that, it's talking about people who were not saved. That's where he says among you. You that are saved. He want some fruit among those who accepted Jesus Christ, even as among other Gentiles, I mean, those who are being saved, is what he says. So what he said here, Paul not only wanted to go to Rome, but he wanted to help them grow in the graces of God. And I, I like to always pause at this and say here, this is the part, and I believe in the body of Christ, that sometimes as a church, as a pastor, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we forget about the Great Commission. We think about it, all it says is go, we want to evangelize the world, which we should do. But there's another part of the Great Commission, which is just teaching them to observe all things, and lo, I'm with you always until the end of the world. What does he mean that? Discipleship. In other words, we ought to have a passion to, in all our heart to see our brothers and sisters grow in Christ. It takes work. A lot of reason why uh, people are, are people coming into the church, they accept the Lord, and they fall out of the church is because we that are there and, and senior saints and those who have been saved for a while, don't take, come upon alongside them and disciple them, teach them how to live a godly life. So Paul, so the text calls it fruit, which is another, uh, what we all in ministry should be doing. We should be bearing fruit in the lives of those that we have been ministered to. And this is what I have found to be a struggle for me, uh, even during this pandemic time and as it coming out now, getting used to this new form of teaching the Bible study on uh, through Facebook and not being in person and in the church right now, because it's hard to really know if there people really getting what you're saying, unless they put in something in the chat or something like that. So I pray that you realize that we're doing this that help you grow. But here's the reason why it's so important to us. John says in John 15 and 16, talking to the disciples, John says here, and he reminds them, and think about it now, not only he's speaking to the disciples then, but this is something that you and I need to hear and remember. He says, ye have not chosen me. This is the reason why what John is saying, Christ says here, you didn't choose him, but he what? But I have chosen you. The disciples didn't choose him. You remember, they would go by the business. I mean, you and I, remember, we were lost. He was not lost. He chose us. That means that he selected a, you and I. And then he ordained them. He said, I ordained you. In other words, he ordained and set them apart. That you shall bring forth fruit in your own spiritual lives and in the lives of others. Now, how do you bear fruit? First of all, in your own personal life, you're going to bear fruit. First of all, you need to be in the Word of God. You need to study the Word of God, pray the Word of God, and apply the Word of God to your own life. The reason why so many of us don't grow is because we hear it on a Sunday or we hear it on a Wednesday night, and that's all we hear. We don't read the Scriptures. We don't make it a part of our everyday life. Let me tell you, if you don't feed your body food, what happens to your body? Your body gets weakened it, and to the point that it, people starve to death. I believe they're in the body of Christ. There are a lot of spiritual malnutrition Christians. The reason why they stress out, the reason why they faint, whether why the way they're going through struggle, reason why they have these because they are not nourishing themselves. So they can't bear fruit, first of all, because they're not healthy. So John is reminding them, he said, I have, I have chosen you, God Christ, Christ is telling them that you should go and bring forth fruit. Then he says here, not only that your fruit that you bear, but it should be what? It remain. He doesn't want you to have fruit and it die off. That whatsoever you ask, 
of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I love this verse. You know why I say, and this I try to tack it on my prayer. I try to say, yeah, Jesus' name. And I asked the Father, so I asked Jesus something that the floor, the, the Lord may be, the Father may be glorified. Here's what I'm saying. If I want Christ to save someone, or if I want the Christ to heal someone, I want Christ, Christ to provide for someone in uh, that I'm praying for. You know what I said? I don't ask for myself. I said, Father, I ask this, that the Father may be what? Glorified. Amen. That's what he said. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So, and this is what he's saying that for you and I to do. And here, as we talk about this fruit, here that our fruit right remain, there are three, three types of spiritual fruit. And I'm not going to give you each one of them here. I'm going to read out and then we're going to talk about the scriptures that said. But I want you to know that when he says that you bear fruit, what kind of fruit he's talking about. Here it is, is in the word of God. He uses the word fruit as a metaphor for attitudes that characterize the spirit of believers. Let me say that again. The fruit is the attitudes and characters that characterize the spirit-led believers. These are here, the fruits that's in our life, the attitudes that you have and the character that you have. And one of those fruits here, let's go to the passage of Scripture that says here, which should be in our life, Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Galatians, here, and uh, just you go back there and hold there, and maybe I didn't get a chance to put it in here, because most of us know that. And here it is, what is it? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. What is he saying? Because these are the fruits that should be in our lives and that we should grow in those. And these are fruits of the Spirit. Amen? So, when he says that, that means that these spirits should be in us as believers. It refers to the action that should be in our lives. One of those things that be in our lives, it means that not only fruit that remain, but it's active. It's active. Look what he says in Romans 6 and verse 22. Romans 6 and 22, he says here, and I think those are not getting it. You got to follow with me for those who are following with me. I, I didn't get it in when it transferred over. But one of the things it says here, Romans 6, 22, for those who want to follow, says here, but now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit of what? Holiness and the end of everlasting life. So one of the fruits that should be in our life is a life of what? Holiness, a life of sanctification, a life that is set apart. That was a fruit that remained, that you and I should have fruit that grows in holiness. Amen? That's what it is. We should have a life of holiness in our life. That's one of the fruits that we were saying. Amen? And the third here speaks of the increase of the souls in the kingdom. Another verse that it says here, it won't be on the screen there, it says, By him, therefore, let us have the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of your lips. The fruit of your lips, giving thanks to his name. So not only do we need to have a fruit of holiness, we need to have, uh, have praise on our lips. Just as you complain, we need to be a praise of God. And I, I wonder about sometimes when people, you, you see them, whether we, is it's in a praise and worship time, people sitting there, they don't want to sing, they don't know. Uh, is the spirit led? Are you being spirit led? Are you bleeding led of the flesh? You don't feel like singing. People that led of the Spirit, he says that we'll have songs and hymns and spiritual songs, make a melody into our hearts, what? Unto the Lord. So we ought to have, the one of the fruits that we ought to have is the fruit of our lips, which is a praise. We ought to be praising God. For those that want to find that passage of Scripture, it talks about it in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 15. The third and final gift that we have there is uh, is not in here. It, it's, it here is coming from it speaks of the increase of soul. So first we feed, we got a fruit of holiness. We see that we need to have fruit of our lips. We need to have actions in our life. But then the third one here is that the increase of souls. Romans 16, 5, without, here it says here, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Look what he says here. Salute my well-beloved Imperaphorus, who is the first fruit of the of Acacia unto Christ. That first fruit then of souls that were saved. So in other words, with the fruit that we have to remain now, the fruit of holiness, 
fruit of praise. We got to have the fruit uh, of thanksgiving. But then he says here, fruit, people, we need to be fruit of bringing people to Christ. And not only they come to Christ, that they remain. I believe here's the problem with the body of Christ. We are forgetting that uh, our job is we don't build the church. Christ says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates will not prevail. But our job is to what? To go. To evangelize. Where evangelism has become almost a byproduct of forgetting where we come to church. We forget about telling other people in our own family life. And, but we come and bring our own self. But here, the reason for each one of us being mentioned here is I want you to go. Paul wanted to know that he was concerned with visiting them. Who people he had never met. And it caused them to grow. And they live out their faith in their character, in other words, people will see their faith in Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, when you have a life of holiness, when you have a life of praising unto God, you have a thankful spirit, and you're concerned for others, people will notice that. That is a great testimony for Christ instead of you. But so often, we, we would go about and caring about that we're saved, and we forget about whether it's a our children, whether it's a wife, whether the wife forgetting about her husband, whether it's a husband forgetting about the wife or our neighbor, we ought to realize there are people watching us every day. And how you live your life ought to be a testimony for Jesus Christ. It tells us here, you just use an analogy that he talks about in First Peter. He talks about a woman, he said that, now without turning there, he said that you may live a life uh, worthy of God, that you have an unsaved husband, that he may be won by your chaste conversation, which means how you live. There are people that maybe never done a door of a church, but they'll see the God in you that want to come to Christ. Which brings me to the seven spirit that we ought to have. Not only a fruitful spirit, but it comes to the next one we talked about is what? An obedient spirit. Paul had an obedient spirit. And the same with us. If you're in Christ, spirit led, we ought to be obedient. And it goes back and it said, obedience is still better than what? Sacrifice. And we're willing, to, we, but we're willing, we'll sacrifice. I don't, I don't feel like it. It's, you know, it's time for us to realize that God has been better to us than we've been saying, aren't you God that glad, glad that God is not treating you like you treat him? How do we get that? Look what Paul said. How is his obedient spirit that comes out? In Romans 1, verse 14, it says here, he said, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the un unwise. So Paul was saying he was under obligation to God and the Romans believers. Now, a debtor means that you have a debt. You know, if you if you buy a car, if you buy a house, you sign on that, uh, that dollar line and say, I'm going to pay on this day, you're in debt to pay that debt. Well, Paul was indebted to the Greeks and to the barbarians and the wise and unwise. Why? Remember on Paul was conversion. On that Damascus road, God, had, uh, Jesus Christ had told him what he was going to do. And you find that here when it says here, because he was obligated to preach to the Gentiles after his conversion in Acts 9. Just follow with me. Acts 9 and 15. Here's why Paul was obligated. He said, but the Lord said unto him. This is what at the day of after Damascus road, he said, go thy way, for he is a what? Chosen vessel unto me, talking about Paul, to bear my name before the Gentiles and to kings and to children of Israel. So Paul, after his conversion on the Damascus road, his, his first person he was going to go was going to go to the Gentiles. Remember, he went to Cornelius' house they, and they were afraid of him because he was persecuting the church. They heard about Paul. But Paul was in debt to the Gentiles. Why? Because this is what God had called him to do. And to, he says to kings, he was to take the gospel to kings and to the children of Israel, which means his own people. The text uh, to the Romans because of their spiritual need to grow in the word of God. There were Romans, Jewish Romans, pe people who was in Rome that were Jewish and come to faith and they need to grow. Just like there's so many people that uh, accept the Lord, but they don't grow beyond that. Most of them got saved. Like we said on the day of Pentecost, and they have not been taught anything, but yet they were staying faithful to what they knew. And I, I like that. You know, uh, they didn't have much, but what they did have, they were faithful to it. And it was told him. So, and this is what here, you may not uh, 
know a bunch of the Word of God. You may not be in study. You may not have been a good Bible student, but you at least they were faithful to it. And so we ought to be the same thing, to faithful to the Word of God. And what comes to that, that there is the age spirit that you have is what? An eager spirit. Now, this is our life because so often you get people who say we get lazy, lackadaisical. I'm saved. I'm getting to heaven. I'm not, I don't want to go share my faith. I'm not want to do this with the Lord here. But Paul had an eager spirit because he was more concerned about those that he wanted to save. So we find that in verse 15 of the text in the first chapter, Romans 1 and 15, he said, this is Paul speaking to the church there. And he says to them, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Not only that he was concerned for those Gentile, but for those who are in Rome. And I like what he said. He wants to what? Preach. That word preach is another word is to proclaim or to herald. He wants to make known to them. He wants to herald. He wants to preach. He wants to proclaim the gospel. And what is the gospel? That Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried and that he was raised the third day according to the scripture that was the good news paul wanted to preach it and to proclaim it amen and he was eager to do it amen so here his determination drove him to go above and beyond a lot of us don't even want to share it even with the people that we know but paul went above and beyond it means that he was willing to sacrifice his physical and spiritual well-being to get the good news out. Let me pause and ask you the question, when is the last time you put yourself out to share the good news about Christ with someone? Whether it was in uh, the beauty parlor getting your hair done, whether it was in the nail parlor getting your nails done, whether it was in the barbershop getting your hair done, or maybe the car wash getting your car done, or, or somewhere you're watching a football game with the guys, or, or you, uh, you're doing something. When, when is the last time that you were eager to share the good news about Jesus Christ. Amen? Think about it. You know, Christ saved you. And if it's we, you got a brother or a sister that's on their way to hell, it ought to burden your heart to see people go there. It's like I hear it said this way. If you was going down the street and you see a house on fire and you know somebody's in there, it's in your neighborhood, are you going to pass it or just call the fire? Are you going to go knock on the door and tell them your house is on fire and you're going to best to best go try to get them and drag them out? That's what we ought to do. We ought to be so eager to keep keep out of darkness into the marvel light by telling them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what Paul was. Look what Paul did. Follow with me in the book of Acts, the 20th chapter. I like this verse here. And underline this here because sometimes we think, oh, we're the only ones going through it or we have to suffer for the gospel. This is Paul's testimony about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And he says, and now... Behold, I go in the spirit unto Jerusalem. This is Paul. Paul was say here, but I go bound. In other words, that bound, that word bound there, man, he, he was, it was so much in him, no matter what, he was bound. He had to go in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Paul said, I'm going. I don't know what's going to happen to me there. I don't know because if Paul had went through a whole lot. Without going back and reading, remember he was shipwrecked. He was left for dead. He was beaten with a cat of nine tail. He was stoned many times. But Paul says here, it wasn't gonna, he wasn't going to let them that stop him from sharing the gospel. And what I'm trying to say, he was eager, no matter what. Some of us are not eager uh, to share with somebody. We want to anything comfort. Let me say something. Most of the time when God did his work, he did it in the midst of chaos and in fire. And he says here, not knowing the things that are going to befall me there. And here it is, verse 23, that I like. He said, say that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. Abide is in me. Paul knew if he'd go there, he was going to have some what? He's going to be bound. He's going to suffer some afflictions. Amen. Because of the gospel. And brothers and sisters, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your job, whether it's in your neighborhood, when you tell people about Jesus Christ, because when you do that, you got to tell them about sin. People don't want to hear about sin, but you got to tell them. The wages of sin is still what? Death. But don't stop there. Let them know. 
Here's the word, that gift, where everybody likes a gift, the free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You let them know. You don't have to because the wages of sin is death. It means that all of sin, and you can go to hell, but you don't have to. There's a free gift that you can give. Heaven is a free gift. It is not earned or deserved. All you do is what? Receive that free gift of Jesus Christ. So Paul said, even though he was afflicted, he was willing to do that. And then verse 24, he says, even though he knew afflictions and bounds with him, he said, but none of these things move me. In other words, Paul, I'm not going to let it stop me because he was eager. He wanted to see people saved so that I may finish my course with joy and that and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says he's not going to let the suffering he's doing, whether people dislike him, being stoned, being ridiculed, or being kicked out, stop him from good. Let me tell you, do you want to see people saved? Do you want to see your children saved? Do you want to see your neighbor saved? Do you want to see your co-worker saved? Do you want to see that husband saved, that wife saved? Are you eager to tell them? Yes, you may be ridiculed, maybe not even get a good meal. Your neighbors might want to talk to you. Your co-worker want to avoid you. But at least you know you did what? You told him. That's why he said, Paul said, I want to finish my course with joy. Not that it had been joy in the process, but knowing he did what God told him to do. And let me tell you, the Great Commission, he said, go into what? All the world. Preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things, law, Whatever I commanded you. And he said, and Lord, I'm with you always to the end of the earth. That's what we all commissioned to. You and I are believers, are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You ought to be telling people about your Savior. Don't be afraid of him. Amen. And then he, he goes on and he says here, he said for, um, and another verse we have here in Colossians 1, 24. This here, I, I like this one too. It says here, who now rejoice in my suffering. This is Paul talking. He's rejoicing in his suffering for you. Who are those? Those he wants to share the gospel with. And filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake in which for church. Paul said he suffered these things that the good news would come out to Jesus Christ. Church, the time that we're living now, and we'll say we're in the last days. I believe it with all my heart. The things that we're going on, you turn it on to the news, read the newspaper. There's some time. We need to be bold about sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. Amen. There's something I need to look within ourselves and see if you're longing to serve others for the cause of Christ. Are you doing it to be seen? You're doing it. And there's many people that they're quick to do some things in the church, but they won't share the gospel. Amen. The church is not going to save you. Christ saved you that you're going to be ambassador. You shall receive what? Power that the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Amen. We stopped here and became become the last spirit that we talk about here. And thank God I get a chance to conclude. And the next week we're going to the next part of here. And that is the final spirit. We talked about first having a what? We had a fruitful spirit. We talked about having a um, obedient spirit. We talked about having an eager spirit. And lastly, the ninth spirit that we ought to have as a bold spirit that we see in Paul. And Paul says in Romans 1.16, he says here, and this is a verse that they got a song that they sing about this. I am not ashamed of the what? The gospel of Christ. For it is what? The power of God unto salvation that every, every, to everyone that believed, to the Jew first and unto the Greek. So Paul did not feel intimidated by the hostile environment that he had in Rome, knowing that some people did not have. He was intimidated by it. And if Paul was intimidated, we should see. And it wasn't because of Paul. It was the Spirit, Holy Spirit in him. I know, if anything about the Roman culture, you know, Roman culture was, uh, and you know, there was a show that used to come on, uh, HBO that I seen sometime, and it was called Rome. And it was it. And it, it was barbaric. When barbaric means that anything that was going on that can be going on was going on in Rome. It was a very sinful at its core. You name it, it was barbaric. The guys dominated the woman. Women, they would drag them by their hair. And if they wanted to have physical relationship, they didn't even ask them. They just took it. 
It was, a matter of fact, I've read one commentary. It was called uh, a cesspool of iniquity. That's what Rome was. And Paul said he didn't care. Even as a hospital environment, people didn't want to hear it. He wanted to care. It was a filthy sewer of sin. But Paul said he was bold. I'm taking the gospel there. And brothers and sisters, if you look at people say uh, uh, Las Vegas is a cesspool. No, L.A. is a cesspool. Every little city is a cesspool. Sin is reverent. And we need to carry the gospel in there and be bold about it. So Paul in verse 16 used four words of the gospel. And these four words, for those who follow me in your Bible, I want you to mark them in your Bible and because they all in this verse will tell us about sharing the good news as we talk about the boldness that should be in you and I. The first is it's the power of God. He wants us to have you there. He talks about it's the power of God. Then he has the other. Um, well, here. well, the power of God. Then there's the, the power, salvation, faith, and righteousness. Those are the words that we have. Then in verse Romans 1 and 17, it says here, uh, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. So in those two verses, 16 and 17, uh, these are the words I want to share with you. The first is the power of God. If you're going to have boldness to share the gospel of God, that Greek word actually means dunamis, which means where we get our word dynamite. It's the same word that we have in Acts 1 and 8, when it said, but you shall receive what? Power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and other words. In other words, you got to realize the boldness that you have. When you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But remember I said you have to have a person, a willing spirit and a submissive spirit. Submit, surrendering your will into the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to tell your son. Don't be afraid to tell your wife. Don't be afraid to tell your daughter. Don't be afraid to tell your co-worker about the good news of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God will give you what? Power. Dynamite power. Amen. So don't be afraid. And the different word is used. Some of you see that word talks about it in John 1 and 12. He said, but as many received him, gave he what? The power. That word is not power. There is a word, a uh, Greek word, actually means authority. But the word we're talking about, Paul is using here in the, he, uh, the, the power of God, he's talking about part of that rearranges life, that do to his power. Amen? So what we're talking about here, we're talking about the boldness, you realize that here, he's reference to the omnipotence of God. When you share the good news about Jesus Christ, you have the power of God with you. The power of God will change a person's desire from sin unto God. In other words, when you tell people about Jesus Christ, he will change them. You think about it, who changed you. It wasn't you. It was the power of God in you. Whether you was a smoker, whether you was a cursor, whether you was a liar, whether you were an adulteress, or whether you wherever your sin was, you did. It wasn't you made up your mind. It was the power of God. Here, let me show you in Scripture how it worked in real life of those in the Thessalonian church. Look at here in First Thessalonians, verses eight and nine, talking about people. And for those of those that have been around know anything about the church of Thessalonica, they had the temple of Diana there. There was uh, sexual immorality there. All kind of sexual perversions was going. The temple was there. They had principal prostitutes were there. People got saved. And what they did, they brought those sinful habits into the church. But here, look what it says here. From And they're talking about, this is a testimony of the Thessalonian church. He said, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Acacia. In other words, people were talking about these saints that have given their life to Christ in Thessalonica. But also in every place, your faith toward God's word is spread abroad so that we may we need not speak anything. In other words, Paul said, we want to tell people about, they know you're saved because the word is spoken up. What's going on? And here's why. Here's why it's spoken. In verse 9, for they themselves, showed us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Here it is. How ye turn to God from idols to serving the true and living God. This is the reason why you know people say, not because they come to church every Sunday, not because they sing in the choir, not because they give their money, not because they've been baptized. One of the reasons why you know they say they turn from their old ways and they're turned to Jesus Christ. They says here, they turn from, from idols 
be an idolatry worship and serve the true and living God. The second word we have there is salvation. Not only do we have the power of God, but salvation. The Greek word here is a word we get the soteria. It's a word we get a soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Paul said he's the power of God unto what? Salvation. Means being saved. Deliverance uh, for God's sake. It tells in uh, Psalms 106, very 8. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. The reason why is why you're saved? It wasn't for you. It was for Christ's sake. Amen. That he might have make his power of God known to you. The gospel saves from the utmost part, church. Amen. It saves us from being lost. It saves us from a per perverse generation. It saves us from the wrath of God. Amen. And the third, the third thing we talk about is faith. And the word faith here, without turning it, is the word to believe. So he said, it's the power of God, which is the dunamis, if a salvation that you may be saved, deliverance from darkness unto his life. Second is faith. Here's the word, the Greek word for faith here. That something Paul said is faith from faith. Here is the word, the Greek word, which means pastuo, which means to trust in, to rely on, and put confidence in. Put rely on what? The gospel, the good news, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You want to be saved? That's why you, you got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he died a death of crucifixion, not for his sin, but for yours. That he was buried. That he was raised from the dead for the glory of the God. That's what it said here. You have faith and trust in that. It tells us, for by grace are you what? Saved, right? Through faith. That not of yourself, it was the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, right? And the last one he says here is the righteousness. So we have what? The power of God, Paul says he bold. He was bold because of the power of God. He was powerful because of salvation, deliverance from sin, and being lost. Thirdly, for having faith. Faith at what? To trust in what Jesus Christ is. And last night is righteousness. And this word righteousness, and here we get to Romans, you're going to find. The word righteousness is used over 35 times in the book of Romans itself. Faith activates the divine power to salvation and brings into the uh, sovereign act of righteousness God revealed. So when we say he, we had no righteousness of our own, all our righteousness is what he says, is filthy rags. We have no righteousness to bring Christ. But once you come to Christ, he, de he imputes in you or he declares you righteous, Right? And uh, I don't know if it's going to be on your screen there, but it says in Romans 5, 4 and 5, it says here, here's how you and I have getting this righteousness that we have. Romans 4 and 5, it says here, but to him that worketh not, here's how you and I get uh, righteousness, believe, but believe on him that justify the ungodly. His faith is what? Count it for righteousness. Paul said in Philippians 3, 8 and 9, yet doubtless I count all things, but for loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says what? For whom I suffered the loss of what? All things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. And here's why. Not found in him having my own what? Righteousness. We have no righteousness. Paul says here, the reason why I want you to hear, first of all, there's the power of God, there's salvation, there's faith, and there is righteousness. He said, not have my own righteousness of the law, but through faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when Paul was writing there, he said, the just shall live by faith. This is not a one-time event. You need to trust Jesus Christ every day. But continuously putting faith in, and faith is a way of life. I close with this one word. I want to read this close passage to you. This is called by the theologian, the perseverance of the saints. I can say a lot about this, and if you were with me on this past Sunday, I preached about talking about the perseverance of the saints. We don't give up. We press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What I'm saying here, brothers and sisters, is that these are the type of spirits that we ought to have. We ought to be concerned about those who are lost. How are we going to get it? We ought to have a fruitful spirit. We ought to have an obedient spirit. We ought to have a eager spirit. And lastly, we ought to have a bold spirit of what? to share the good news about Jesus Christ. God loves you. God loves your brother and sisters, your friend around there. But are you willing to let him use you as Paul did in the church of Rome to share the gospel about Jesus Christ? Let us close with a word of prayer. Next week, I want to say this, we'll be talking about the wrath of God. Paul's going to shift the whole time. Now in these first 
eight, 17 verses, he talked about the gospel and what he did and how it But now he's going to be the rubber meets the road for those who are rejecting the gospel. You heard the free gift, but then it comes with a consequence. So let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Father, for what we have learned these past three weeks, Father, about your son, Jesus Christ, about your servant, Paul, and the spirit that he has, Father, that should be in all of us, Father, that we would follow and allow the Holy Spirit to use us to carry the good news, Father, about what your son, Jesus Christ, have done. For how much, Father, that you loved us so much, Father, that you said in your word that God so what? Love the world means that you loved us so much. Even though we were dead in our trespasses and sin and still sinning, you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, Father. That you said, whosoever believeth that we trust in his death shall have everlasting life. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So tonight, Father, we pray for that person tonight who's listened. For maybe they have done that, Father, but yet, Father, they're living a life that they don't show, Father, that they're really saved. They need, they're in a backslidden state, Father, and they're living in sin. Father, but you said if we confess our sin, that you would be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So tonight, Father, as I close this portion, before I even go to the other part, I want to pray right now, Father, for that person that's listening tonight, and you know that you're out of the will of God. I'm asking you tonight that if this Holy Spirit has brought some sin in your life and you need you to repent of it, it's time for you to rededicate your life to Lord. He's just as the prodigal son, the father was sitting there waiting for him to come home. And what did he do? He said, go get the, the robe for him. Get a kill of fat of bread. Put the ring on his finger. My son that was lost have come at home. The father is waiting for you to come back home. He loves you. You're still his child. Some action tonight. You need to rededicate your life to the Lord and do that. And once you do that, if you have been outside of the church, it's time you be there. Go find the church on Sunday morning. Go to church and ask God to help you. And I pray right there now, Father, through the power of the Spirit, for those who are listening right now, who are out of the fellowship and don't have a church home, tonight they leave say, Father, I'm going to find a church home. I won't be in my worship you on Sunday. We thank you for what you're going to do now, Father. Because you said in your word, we ask anything according to your will. And we know it's your will, Father, because you say you're long-suffering, that not any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So we pray tonight, Father, that that man, that woman, that child, that saint, that already saved, that's in a backslidden state, will come to repentance. And, Father, and that they will receive them unto yourself. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God keep you. We pray that once again we realize that continue to share us and like us on Facebook and on YouTube. We're trying to get back into things here. Remember, we have our in-person service from 8.30 to 9.45. And for those who want to come, if you're being a pastor in the area or you just want to, you say, you know, I need to change the church home. And if you want to be held accountable, if you want our church to grow, and you've been watching us on Facebook, and we would love to have you as a member of Good News Church. You can always, you can call the church there, or you can just email me at Pastor Ter, T E R R at AOL dot com, or you can email the church at Good News Church Pasadena at Gmail dot com and say, you know, I would like to be a member and know more about your church. Then you can tell us, and we want to actually invite you. And this coming uh, Sunday during our worship service, we will be celebrating Good News Church 58th church anniversary. We would love to have you there to come fellowship with us with our singing. Be a good fellowship. We have a guest speaker, uh, Pastor Michael Herring, uh, will be speaking to us, bringing the uh, gospel merch word to us. There will be a time of fellowship, and you know more about it. So we would love to have you. That's doing our eight thirty service on Sunday morning. So God bless you and God keep you. Remember, everybody is somebody in the eyes of the Lord. Be like David said. I was glad when they said unto me, "What? Let us go into the house of the Lord." Have a blessed week.